This is Cornstalks and Sports Talk, your go-to Iowa-based sports show, hosted by the one and only Elliot Clough. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows granger has got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. What's up, Cedar Valley, and hello to the Hawkeye State. This is Cornstalks and Sports Talk, your Iowa-based sports show here on AM950, KOEL and KOEL.com. With me, Elliot Clough. At Elliot Clough on Twitter. I'm a UNI insider for Town Square Media. Excellent stuff on today's show, as always. But we've got Brent Brigham from the Colorado Springs Gazette joining us to tell us about this Air Force squad that UNI is taking on today. And then Matt Tillifson of Jackrabbit Illustrated joins to discuss what SDSU is bringing to Kinnick Stadium this weekend as well. They're taking on the Hawkeyes in what I think is probably going to be one of the better FBS-FCS matchups of the weekend. But we can't get too ahead of ourselves quite yet. Matt's going to help us out there. Now, what I want to do here on this first segment of Cornstalks and Sports Talk this Saturday morning, this first Saturday of September, football season upon us, is to... Jump, well, I guess jump ahead a little bit. Get ahead of ourselves here on this first segment. What I want to do is, well, typically within national media, I know one big thing that that Rich Eisen does is the overreaction Monday. And I know it's popular with ESPN as well. And what I want to do on today's episode of Corn Stocks and Sports Talk is do, I guess, pre-overreaction. What I think is going to happen this weekend for UNI, Iowa, and Iowa State this weekend as Iowa State's taking on Southeast Missouri State, SEMO. Iowa's fighting South Dakota State in Kinnick Stadium, and then UNI, of course, taking on Air Force like we've discussed already here. But what I want to do is predict what's going to happen today in all three of those games and then predict how each fan base is going to react during said games or the coming week after. So it's uh, there's there's some moving parts here, but I think you'll follow along with what I'm saying as as we get started here on this Saturday morning. So first off, my expected overreactions from week 1 of college football here in Iowa. We'll start with Iowa State since we're not really doing a huge preview for them. I decided it it wasn't a, a, a priority for the weekend because they're taking on SEMO. So not not uh, at the top of the list for this week's episode. But what I'm thinking the overreaction will be from the Iowa State fan base who can get gloaty at times, a little bit overconfident, and maybe, maybe that's my bias towards you and I and having grown up an Iowa fan. But... What I'm going to predict is that Hunter Deckers goes absolutely nuts on this SEMO defense. And I say that because I actually like what I've seen from Hunter Deckers. I think he's shown poise. I think he's shown confidence. And I think he is a competent quarterback. And I think he will have a good season or multiple seasons for Iowa State while he's in Ames. And so my prediction from the fan base after what I expect Deckers to to have a great game, I expect 300 plus yards passing, four touchdowns, something like that versus SEMO. He might run for a few too. We know he's got he's got legs. So what I expect from the Cyclone fan base is to say he's going to be better than Brock Purdy. Wow. Or he's already better than Brock Purdy, who is not arguably definitely the greatest quarterback in Iowa State football history. And I mean with those type of numbers, I would not be shocked if the Iowa State fan base comes out and says the Hunter Deckers should be considered for Heisman or or he starts, you know, uh, just he goes off on this defense. Right. That's that's fully what I'm expecting to happen. The Iowa State fan base to go crazy and and start making outlandish, outlandish compliments of 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 Hunter Deckers. And, and again, this is not a slam on Hunter Deckers. I think he's competent. I think he's capable. I think he's confident. But just because Hunter, or excuse me, Xavier Hutchinson is an NFL wideout, Jalen Knowles steps up, 
and the Cyclones beat the crap out of SEMO, that doesn't mean that Hunter Deckers is going to win the Heisman or is even in Heisman con- uh, contention this early in the season. For those of you who don't know, SEMO, Southeast Missouri State, is a school in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, that has less than 10,000 students. So I- I'm fully expecting Iowa State to to make a mountain out of a molehill, more or less, and say Hunter Deckers is worthy of the Heisman after one real start at the quarterback position in in his, uh, I believe it's his junior year in Ames. He might be a redshirt sophomore. Who knows with, with COVID regulations and, and, and COVID rules. But let's move on now to Iowa. What I expect from the Hawkeyes and their fan base this weekend. Shocker, I'm going quarterback again here, and I think it's Spencer Petras plays like garbage, and the Hawks squeak out a win. That's what I'm expecting, because the Hawks are good at this, and Iowa State's good at it too, is is not really showing up on this week one thinking it's going to be a gimme win, but you can't really do that against a program like South Dakota State. That's how they lost to North Dakota State, however long ago that was. That's how Iowa State lost to North Dakota State, however long ago that was as well. And South Dakota State, this is a damn good football team. Number two in the FCS in the preseason polls, and for a good reason. They went to the national championship the last time Mark Gronowski was their starting quarterback. They lost to Sam Houston State. Last season, he was out with an ACL tear, and uh, Ola Doken, I can't remember his first name, but Ola Doken was a grad transfer. He comes in. They're still a great team. You and I beat them in uh, in Brookings, they lost to South Dakota on a Hail Mary, and I believe they fell to North Dakota State in the playoffs. That might be wrong, but I know they beat Sacramento State. Anyway, South Dakota State is a damn good football team. You can't count teams like this out in matchups with the FBS programs, like Kansas when they beat them, I think, within the last two years. And then like last year when they beat Colorado State with Oladokun as their co- starting quarterback. And so... We'll talk more about this, of course, with Matt Tullifson of Jackrabbit Illustrated here on Cornstock and Sports Talk, AM 950 KOEL and KOEL.com. But I've seen this team live on multiple occasions. This team is real. I believe in Mark Ronowski. He's a guy who can run the ball. He's a guy who can throw the ball. And their defense is freaking great. One of the best in the entire nation in the FCS. Their run defense is phenomenal. Passing defense is one thing, but we... we <laughs> We all know Spencer Petras isn't the greatest quarterback in the world. I don't necessarily trust his ability, nor Brian Ferentz's ability to adjust the offense and make it better and easier for Spencer Petras. So my prediction, my prediction is that before the end of the first half, everybody's calling for Alex Padilla to come out and start the second half or even get snaps already. And that Brian Ferentz is, is called to be fired once again. Shocker. Because he is leading the quarterbacks now as well as being the offensive coordinator. So what I'm saying is is Petrus throws an interception or two. It's a close game at half, probably 10-7, maybe 7-3. Because the Iowa offense just can't get going. And then we see what happens in the second half. I do think Iowa's going to squeak out this game. Probably going to win it by a touchdown or or a field goal or maybe, maybe just 10 points. But as good as South Dakota State is, they're not an FBS program. Right? Like, I cover UNI. I went to UNI. There's a little bit of that bias there, right? Like, like I fully expect UNI to compete against Air Force, and they've done that two times in a row against Iowa State, where they competed with them right until the very end, almost beat them. But there is a clear distinction between FCS and FBS programs. And when programs like Iowa play someone like South Dakota State, that should be a win. That should be a not necessarily an easy win, but maybe a convincing one. At least 17 points in my mind's eye. That's what you should see when an FBS program, that's a quality FBS program, matches up with an FCS. It's different when it's Kansas, right? But I think it's going to be a squeaker of a win. I think Iowa wins by 10 points or less. Now on to UNI, my specialty here on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk with me, Elliot Clough, UNI Insider, at Elliot Clough on Twitter. Now what I expect for this game you and I versus Air Force in Colorado Springs at altitude from the fan bases. I'll be on Twitter the whole time. You can follow along with me there. And if you're listening, you know I'm calling it. I'm I'm not calling you out, but I'm saying, hey, this is what I expect. And maybe if you're not listening, uh, you'll prove my point. I fully expect the 
fan base to blame the altitude as part of the reason why you and I ultimately can't squeak out the win, which is legit. They'll only be there Friday and Saturday, so they don't really get time to acclimate at all. Then there's the new guy at left tackle and Matthew Vanderslice, who's taking over for Trevor Penning. And he's going to be facing a really talented pass rusher. We'll talk about that more in this next segment with Brent Brigham from the Colorado State, or excuse me, Colorado Springs Gazette. And the big one that that I really expect to happen, and there might be another one too before we before we get out of here on this first segment. The big one that I see happening from the fan base on Twitter is is the calling, uh, the the asking of coach Mark Farley to put in Joshua Jenkins. And this is again, uh, these are no, this, these aren't, this isn't a slight on Josh Jenkins. I'm really excited about what he brings. I thought that was probably the most underrated signing of the 2022 football class. I'm jacked to see what he becomes in Cedar falls, but he is a freshman. We have to keep that in mind. He is a freshman from Des Moines Lincoln. We've seen some cool highlights. I've seen him at practice. I think he's every bit uh, a you and I running back and will compete for a job probably next year. But Air Force was the number nine running defense in FBS last season in rushing defense in the entire FBS. Not not just the 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 Mountain West, that's for sure. Probably the best. I'm I'm assuming they were the best. I didn't see the rest of the Mountain West. But probably the best. And what I expect to happen is we'll see Dom Williams, we'll see Vance McShane, we'll, we might see a little bit of Harrison Bay Bowie, the transfer from Eastern Illinois. Those are the three that I expect to get the majority of the snaps this season once Harrison Bay Bowie gets acclimated more to the offense uh, because Dom Williams and, and Vance McShane have been around for a little while. Those are more known commodities. Harrison Bay Bowie's only been around for the summer and then for, for fall practices where I think Joshua Jenkins has only been around for the fall. I'm not positive there. Don't quote me on that. I, I would not be surprised if he got in some real work over the over the summer, too, with some of these guys. But Jenkins is a dynamic freshman, and I, I would not be surprised if we see him get some time this year. But the kid needs to put on weight. Like, like you see his frame. You see him running out there with some of the ones, some of those fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh year seniors. It's like, yeah, I can, I can tell that kid's a freshman. Typically at these practices in the fall, these are the guys that need to put on weight, right? They all look slight. They, they look huge if it was a high school game but they all look slight compared to other division one football players out there that I've been doing a long time. And he is a freshman. He does not have any real experience at the division one level. Sure. He's got practice. Sure. He's probably been hit pretty hard by some of these guys. Sure. He hurdled one of his teammates in practice, but he has not seen full bore competition, let alone against a team like air force. So, Again, I'm not saying I don't think he's going to contribute this season. He'll probably play those four games and and then he'll get his red shirt. But if your rushing attack can't get going against the team that was ninth in the FBS last season at 102 yards per game allowed and 3.4 yards allowed per carry, I don't think the freshman who needs to put on weight will come in and fix it. I don't see that happening. I think it's going to be Vance McShane, Dom Williams, and Harrison Bay Bowie back there for the UNI rushing attack. And then their pass defense is pretty good, too. I mean, it's not like they only keyed on on the running attack or or that the opposing team only launched the ball. Like the opposing teams in the Mountain West only, you know, focused on the air raid type of offense and didn't run the ball at all. And that's why their run defense was statistically good. Their run defense and pass defense are both good. So... They only, I mean, they only allowed 194 passing yards per game in 2021. So, I mean, I wouldn't even be shocked if we see somebody calling for Matt Morrissey. I mean, I know people last year in that game against Iowa State, they wanted to see Theo Day at different points in the in that game, and ultimately we did see him. He did take that starting job over Will McIlvain. But this isn't, you know, the incumbent starter versus the Michigan State transfer like it was last year. And like we saw the competition, there's always competition in fall, but this is different. Theo Day's been there. He's done it before. He is a Michigan State transfer. He was a three-star recruit. He was the number one recruit at quarterback in Michigan when he was coming out of high school. Matt Morrissey's a JUCO transfer. And the kid can, I mean, I've said it so many times. I've said this exact phrase. The kid can sling it, which he can, but he's not Theo Day. He hasn't started. 
He's, he's played a little bit sparingly, and we saw what we saw against Eastern Washington, but this is Theo Day's job, and I, I, I can guarantee that. So my expected overreactions and predictions from all of the uh, Iowa State school programs in football, Iowa State, it's that the Iowa State fan base thinks Hunter Decker's in Heisman contention after one game. Second, I think the overreaction, which might not be an overreaction from the Iowa fan base against South Dakota State this weekend, is that at halftime, they want Spencer Petrus out of the game because it's a 10-7 game or a 7-3 game or or something ridiculously close with South Dakota State. And then for you and I, it's that the fan base wants to see Joshua Jenkins in this first game. I am not there yet. Those are those are the overreactions for this first segment here on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk. Don't go anywhere. We got Brent Brigham of the Colorado Springs Gazette coming up here on this Saturday morning as we approach kickoff. And more college football from the Panthers, Hawkeyes, and the Cyclones. Stay right here on AM 950 KOEL and KOEL.com for more corn stocks and sports talk. The United Panthers will take on the Air Force Falcons to open up their season today. That game starts at 10 a.m. Central Time. So we're getting you the preview just in time here on corn stocks and sports talk on AM 950 KOEL and KOEL.com. We've got Brett Brigham of the Colorado Springs Gazette here on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk. So, Brent, you are the the beat writer for Air Force football. First question, the option offense. That's what they're famous for, right? So I think the general fan sees that as a simplistic sort of offense. What makes it so to, so effective for Air Force? Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly not simplistic. Um, <laughs> they've, they've run this, you know, for so long and have had so many wrinkles come into it. And Troy Calhoun, before he before he came to Air Force, he was the offensive coordinator of the Houston Texans. He had been at the Denver Broncos before that on the offensive side under Mike Shanahan when they had such a good running team, you know, year in and year out. So he's taken a lot of those zone read concepts and brought them into it and added that to the triple option. So, and then Mike Deason, the offensive coordinator, he's been there for, well, he was quarterback for Air Force, and he's been in this role for about 16 years. And he has kind of perfected the misdirection, pre-snap movements. So they'll come out every play in a different alignment, different personnel packages. And, you know, they all are so well-trained in what they're doing because this, you know, Air Force isn't using any transfers or everybody here is, you know, third, fourth year for the most part. Plus many of them went to the prep school. So they've been running this system and so they run it with just such precision, such quickness. And then there's a lot of talent here, too. So it's kind of everything. You know, the minds that have poured in just decades of knowledge into this, the personnel, and then just understanding how to how to exploit a defense. You know, that's the kind of the, the base of the triple option is to make sure at least one defender can be unblocked. And, you know, then you're suddenly playing on 11 on 10. And that that's to your advantage. I tell you what, I've been watching a few highlights of, of Air Force and seeing what they're they're capable on the offensive side of the ball. I think it was the game against Utah State last year. It was like a fullback handoff up the middle, but with a different a bunch of different things going on in the backfield. It was like a 40 yard touchdown. So if that tells you anything, I think that's Air Force in a nutshell. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, like I said, you there's so much pre-snap movement. And then once the snap, once the ball snapped, you know, fans can usually tell where the ball is, but the linebackers, <laughs> the secondary, they're having a hard time picking it up. And and then suddenly the ball is on the perimeter for a guy who's running four or five. You know, so it's <clears throat> yeah, you you and then the discipline of defending that, and then suddenly they hit you over the top with a pass because you know, for the past eight plays, you've been focused in on the fullback, and then you kind of didn't notice the tight end leaking out or the wing back, you know, coming off his block and then suddenly running down the seam. So they they are operating. <laughs> They know what they're doing, and they again they know how to exploit a defense. So, how about the defense for the Falcons? What what are they like on that side of the ball? Well, I mean, first of all, the whole system, the holistic approach, helps the defense a lot because the offense keeps the ball for so long. So the defense generally doesn't have to play as much, you know, as a, as a conventional defense would. Um, there's a lot of attacking. You know, they do have a new defensive coordinator this year. Uh, Brian Knorr, but he had been on staff, so I don't think there's going to be anything major new. Uh, last year, they were top, I think, top 15 on defense in total yards and scoring. Um, it's it's a very good defense, and it brings back basic – they lose Jordan Jackson, who was drafted by the, the Saints, but pretty much every position has a starter back who has started multiple games. 
And in the secondary, Trey Taylor is a safety. He was a standout last year in the linebacker group. Vince Ta- Vince Sanford, uh, you know, was an all Mountain West type with, I believe, 19 tackles for loss or some a, a large number of tackles for loss. And on the front, they've got Chris Herrera, who's a three year starter. So each position group has kind of its own standout. But again, there's experience throughout the group, and it, and it was a good group last year. So that's the guys you wanted back or back. 17 tackles for a loss. I have it right here. Nine and a half sacks. So, uh, so yeah, he's, he's <laughs> definitely productive. Again, we have Brent Brigham of the Colorado Springs Gazette. He's the Air Force football beat writer there. We're talking here. Uh, the, the Air Force and UNI football game happening today. We're on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk on AM 950, KOEL, and KOEL.com. Air Force, they've only lost five games in the last two years. A lot of guys coming back to, like you mentioned, a, a few names across uh, the defense and on the offense. Are expectations high once again this season? Absolutely. And yeah, when you say the last five games, the last two years, that's counting the COVID year, which was just weird here because about 40 players left for the semester because it looked like Air Force wasn't going to be playing. And so they made that decision. The academy worked with them on that. And then suddenly there was a season. So they had, especially on the defensive side, guys who weren't supposed to be playing, uh, were playing, and they went three and three. The year before that, so the last two full seasons, they've been at full strength. They went 11 and two in 2019 and 10 and three last year. So this is this is a program hitting on all cylinders right now. And like I said, they bring all those guys back. So yeah, expectations are through the roof around this team. I mean, it's the Mountain West are still picked second in the division, but only by a couple points behind Boise State, which has been favored every year it's been in the conference. So, and they did beat Boise State on the road last year. They get them at home this year. So when you look at kind of where that stands, you know, the, you like Air Force in that matchup. Uh, it's, you know, because the the main positions where you want experience are flush with experience. You know, the quarterback is a third-year starter. Fullback is a three-year starter. You know, because of that and the success they've come off, I think everybody's expecting them to start hot. And, and you know, the sky's the limit, really, with this team. Now, with the elevation, that's been a big topic of conversation for for UNI fans and for the media. Uh, Coach Farley and, and the Panthers, they won't be able to get out there until the Friday beforehand, before the game, uh, being a you know an FCS school. You only got so much for a budget, <laughs> only so much they can do to prepare, too. How much do you expect it or does it generally affect teams that aren't in that high elevation type of area practicing on a regular basis? Yeah, it does. I mean, obviously, they play in the Mountain West, so most of the teams that come in here, or a lot of them at least, are at, at, at altitude themselves. But, you know, the, the way they play, that's part of why they do what they do. You know, they they have options in what they can run, but they choose to run the triple option because it keeps defenses on the field so long. You know, once you're, once you're at snap 8, 9, 10 in a series, that gets pretty tough to contend with, you know, not only with the offense you're facing as it gets momentum, but also as you're getting more and more winded. So, you know, most teams utilize their depth when they come here, they try to, you know, they try to tap into that, but, you know, it's just one of those things, you know, across the front range, you know, you talk about the avalanche, the nuggets, everybody kind of gears what they do toward taking advantage of that. And air force is no different. And it is, it is difficult. It impacts everybody a little bit differently. You know, some people don't even notice a difference. Some people are completely winded. So, you know, until until Northern Iowa gets here, they really won't know what to expect. But, you know, it's we'll just see. You know, it's hard to it's hard to say because most of these, you know, football usually you see people once a year. So was it elevation? Was it execution? You don't really know what what the variables are. Sure. And back to those those few games that they've they've lost over these last few years. What was the common factor? Because I clearly they don't lose a lot of games. Is it turnovers? Is is it playing uh, somewhere else that <laughs> isn't their home field and having that home field advantage? What is it uh, about those games that that Air Force wasn't able to get it done? A lot of it's just been really quality opponents. I mean, one of the two of the losses I believe were San Diego State, which Air Force hasn't beaten in a, a long time. San Diego State's just a a difficult matchup because they stopped the run so well. Uh, last year, you mentioned that Utah State game. Utah State came in with a new coach. I think it was week two or three. It was really early in the season. And they ran with such a quick tempo. They just would get to the ball, snap it, and, you know, had kind of a run-and-shoot type attack. And Air Force was, you know, a little bit short-staffed in the secondary. Trey Taylor, the safety I mentioned, he wasn't playing in that game. 
So it was just that combination of a, of a weird team to prepare for, kind of like the way Air Force attacks other people. You just don't see that very often, just that extremely quick hitting uh, passing attack. And that, that was what happened in that one. Trying to think of the other ones. There haven't been that many other ones around. Uh, let's see. Army. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. The <laughs> old Army. Yeah. Army has been two of those and uh, Army's just gotten a lot better and they know air force, you know, they play them every single year. They, their defense is able to see that style in practice. And those games of every single one of them has come down to one play, you know, so it's kind of a flip, flip of the coin. Who's going to make the stop on the goal line last year, army scored on a fumble in the end zone. You know, if air force recovers that they win the game, army recovers it. They win the game. So, you know, it's all of the losses have the common thread is they've been very, very close. And it's always been against a very good team. Utah State, like I mentioned, they won the Mountain Division last year in the Mountain West. So it wasn't a fluke. They were a good team. But even that one came down to a field goal. So Air Force has been in every single game. It's just, you know, because possessions are such a premium, one or two little things can really turn a game. Again, we're talking with Brent Brigaman. We're previewing the UNI versus Air Force football game happening today. That starts at 10 a.m. You're listening to Corn Stocks and Sports Talk with me, UNI Insider, Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter. So is there a sort of common sentiment around this game for Air Force fans? Do they expect it to be a gimme win against an FCS school? I mean, I think that's their condition to expect that because every single year Air Force opens with an FCS team and every year – it's not a it's not a contest. But for the past month, Troy Calhoun has been emphasizing that Northern Iowa is not like every other FCS team. And you know, I don't know how many times he's pointed out Kurt Warner, uh, you know, a first round draft pick last year. And I mean, I know it. I went to the University of Kansas when Terry Allen was a coach and he had just come from Northern Iowa. So I was familiar with that background. So I, I think the message has been out there that this won't be the typical opener. Uh it is curious scheduling for Air Force. Air, Troy Calhoun does not like to be challenged in the first week. You know, they they always schedule FCS. It's usually a team that, when you really look at it, is down, you know, and and it's parents weekend at the academy. You know, all these cadets who were dropped off in June and went through basic training, they're seeing their families for the first time. They like it to be a fun, festive atmosphere. Obviously, Northern Iowa was the kind of team that can come down here and, and you know, throw a crimp in those plans. But I... I don't think, based on what we've seen from Air Force in the last two years, that there's any reason to think Air Force shouldn't be heavily favored in this game. But I do think they understand that they have a challenge. And I think the fan base more or less understands that, too, with, again, the caveat of every single year they're told by Troy Calhoun that this is going to be the FCS team that's going to really challenge them. And and we just haven't seen it yet. Last question for you, Brent. Uh, purely out of curiosity, really. I mean, there's a, a few players on the team at UNI, and I'm, I mean, all over the country, really, that were three-star athletes coming out of high school. They had offers from schools like Air Force and, and Army. And and so uh, one one name in particular, Josiah Galvin. I don't know if that rings a bell. He's from Iowa, uh, a crazy good athlete. He played almost every sport he could, and now he's at UNI. He's a freshman. But – with this level of play difference between Air Force and UNI, and obviously the the Air Force being a military school, do you know what the pull is for some of these higher profile recruits to pick an Air Force as opposed to being basically a full time student and football player at, at a different school where where it's not <laughs> military? What's what's the pull? Is it is it just the fact that it's a military school? What is it? Uh, well- no, I mean, most of the guys who end up coming here, who I talked to, they had no military background. They The military was not on their radar at all until, until Air Force appeared. But what Air Force offers them is, first of all, a guaranteed job after graduation at good pay. And, you know, being the Air Force, you're not most of them are not signing up to go to the infantry. You know, a lot of them will be in support roles, acquisitions, which is more or less a business and they serve five years and mo- most of them, you know, transition out after that point. Many of them end up going to pilot training and make it a career. But it's that guaranteed job that a lot of them, you know, given their backgrounds or whatnot, they understand that a good paying job guaranteed right out of school is a good thing. <laughs> and a lot of them are just high academic guys. And they understand that this is this is an acad- this is an Ivy League quality education that they won't pay for at all which the Ivy league doesn't offer athletic scholarships. So that's not the case there. Cause a lot of them had Harvard and Yale, you know, as offers, 
So they they don't pay for the education. They get an excellent education. They have a guaranteed job, and they get to play play football at a high level in the Mountain West. So, and the history of Air Force. I mean, this was a this was a top ten team in the 1980s. They've had a lot of you know very good teams through the years. They they basically go to a bowl game every season. You know, there's a lot football wise to offer, and and I think they're getting the guy who understands he's probably not going to the NFL. But even that. They do offer the opportunity now. You can delay your commissioning into the Air Force while, you know, if you are drafted or if you're, you know, if you're picked up by a team, the Air Force will let you go check that out and see if you can stick, knowing that you'll either eventually have to pay back your education or or serve later on. So it's kind of, you know, for a lot of these guys, they see it as the best of all worlds. They get the great education and the guaranteed job, but they are not held back in any way in football. So you have seen a lot of an uptick in the talent in recent years, especially with the new NFL rules. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's still an academy. You still have to come in and go through basic training, go through a lifestyle where football is not your priority. You know, it's one of three because they stress military academics and athletics. So it's, it's a tough chore, which is, you know, again, why the coaching job, the service Academy coaches do is always, you know, it's, it's pretty impressive, but they, uh, they do have a lot to work with, and they do have a lot working against them. He is Brent Brigaman of the Colorado Springs Gazette. He's their Air Force football beat writer joining us here on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk on AM 950 KOEL and KOEL.com this morning. Go follow him on Twitter. It's Brent Brigaman there. You can follow along, I'm sure, with the game today as the Panthers are taking on the Falcons. Brent, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, maybe I'll see you. Yeah, I'll be in the press box. <laughs> All right, folks, don't go anywhere. We have that third and final segment here on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk coming up. Matt Tullison of JackrabbitIllustrated.com is joining us. He's going to help us preview that Iowa versus South Dakota State game happening today. So stay tuned for more Corn Stocks and Sports Talk on AM 950, KOEL, and KOEL.com. And we've got our second preview for this weekend coming up right now on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk on AM 950, KOEL and KOEL.com. We're talking with Matt Tullifson of Jackrabbit Illustrated. He's joining us to discuss that SDSU Jackrabbits game versus the Iowa Hawkeyes in Kinnick Stadium at 11 a.m. Central today. Matt, Matt, thanks so much for joining us. What's the sense you're getting from, from the Jackrabbits team is, is they will soon be playing one of the top programs in, in the FBS. Yeah, thanks for having me first, Elliot. Here, appreciate it. Um, the sense we're getting is there there is a quiet confidence among Jackrabbit fans uh, about this game. Uh, you know, I think a lot of folks think it's going to be a close game into the fourth, like these FBS FCS contests tend to be, uh, especially in the regional matchups. A lot of times, um, and you know, this team is ranked number two. Uh, in, in most or in many of the polls this year for FCS for the Jacks. And uh, there's just a general excitement about this team. Uh, there's, a, there's a confidence among the players. The goal is this year to win a national title. Um, and, you know, people really expect this team to be competitive against Iowa. I think it would be a disappointment to the fan base and the players and the team uh, if it was a blowout this year. So they've, I mean, and not to uh, to necessarily say that there's a guarantee they're going to win or, or there's a thought there, but they've done it before. They beat Kansas. They beat Colorado State. Uh, they beat Colorado State last year, correct? Yes. Yep. So, I, I mean, still big underdog, though. I mean, do they do they like the fact that they're underdogs, considering they are number two in the country and now they're moving up to the FBS level playing the Hawks? Um would they would you say that they like the fact that they're underdogs because that doesn't happen very often I do you know I think like you and I uh there's a there's a number of players on this roster that grew up in Iowa that dreamed of being Hawkeyes that for whatever reason didn't get their offer or shot or maybe they were only offered a walk on with the Hawkeyes whatever it may be um you know there probably is some sense and motivation of that you know uh but I do think overall this team uh, Coach Stiglmeyer does just such a good job of helping them look at the bigger picture, uh, you know, and his, his mantra of one game at a time. Um, I, I just really think, you know, there, there's, there's, it's kind of nice not being the favorite in a game, right? You have some of that pressure is off of you. Um, you really get to go out and, and just ball out, right, as they say. So, 
And, and on top of that, I mean, North Dakota state who is South Dakota state's rival, obviously uh, made their way to, to Kinnick just a few years ago and, and beat the Hawks. Yeah. I, I remember that game. We watched it in the tailgating lot. Uh, you know, what, what an upset that was. And I think that does show, you know, these Missouri Valley teams uh, play a physical brand of ball. You know, they, they're, they're big up front, you know, you and I, NDSU, SDSU, Illinois State, uh, a lot of years have huge offensive lines that can c- compete um, at the FBS level. Uh, defensive line, you know, maybe in question a little bit. It's kind of hard to find some of those 325 pound monsters that uh, FBS schools tend to trot out. Um, but really, I think the the brand that the Valley plays is really comparable to the Big Ten in a lot of ways. So they'll be ready for it in that regard, I think. Now, you mentioned the the Big Ten and, and the style of play. When we look at Iowa's offense, I was just telling you a little bit before we, we sat down and started, is that the offense was rough in 2021. Spencer Petras, uh, definitely not what Hawk fans were hoping for. And then there's the Jackrabbits defense, which is typically loaded, very talented. I mean... Let's I, I, I could very well see Iowa going out into the second quarter, the third quarter, having a 7-0 lead. What kind of momentum would that give the Jackrabbits? Yeah, I, I do think uh, one player the Jacks are getting back on offense is Mark Gronowski, who seems to thrive in these pressure cooker moments. I'm not sure if you remember him from his freshman year down in the Uni Dome, that season opener win down there. Uh, We saw that all throughout his true freshman year, just in these big moments, really rallying this team, um, you know, to to the victory. And I think if it's close like that, man, I just love his leadership in those type of moments. In terms of the defense for the Jacks this year, just to get a little bit specific here, we have a very good front seven again this year. Uh, Defensive line um, is going to be 10 deep and it's 10 quality players throughout uh, defensive tackle they brought in this year, uh, a, a transfer from Valdosta State. He was an All-American, uh, a D2 All-American, who uh, 6'1", 290. Uh, how he looks um, reminds me of the big D tackle the Panthers had last year. Jared um, Brinkman. Jared Brinkman. Just how he looks. He's just a wide, squattier body than we typically see at our def- for our defensive tackles. So I'm very interested in that and see how he looks uh, at the FCS level. Uh, Adam Bach from Solon, right? Is that how you say it? Solon? Okay. Yep. Solon. Um, yep. He is just, he's one of the best linebackers in the FCS. Um, he has just completely transformed his body this summer. And he went from being 11th, I think is in the final voting for the Buchanan award last year, which is given to the uh, best defensive player in the FCS. Um, he's back and man, he looks good. Um, this would be his third year starting the real question for the Jackrabbits is on the back end. You know, we lost two experienced senior safeties. We lost Don Gardner to the NFL. He's been playing very well with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, so our cornerback position, and our safety position is really in flux. And I know that Iowa has some really quality uh, younger wide receivers. Uh, Arlen Bruce, uh, Keegan Johnson, two players that jump out. Uh, Keegan Johnson obviously has the Jackrabbit connection. His older brother, Cade. Uh, was a standout at SDSU, multi-year All-American, and now with the Seattle Seahawks. So that's that's where I think the matchup is going to be. Um, you know, we talked about the physicality in the trenches, and I do think that the Jacks have um, the girth <laughs> and, 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 and the skill uh, in the trenches to, mm. to, to really um, to hold their own down there. So we'll see. At uh, Minnesota, when we played Minnesota in 2019, um, the Gophers had a huge offensive line, and the Jacks really stymied their rushing attack for much of that game. So we'll have to see. I tell you what, if there was one word I was not expecting on this uh, this segment, it was girth. <laughs> yep, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, we're talking with Matt Tullifson of JackRabbitIllustrated.com here on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk on AM 950, KOEL, and KOEL.com. So let's look at the offense, Jackrabbit offense. You mentioned Mark Gronowski, fantastic freshman year, freshman season for for South Dakota State. 
Where's his health at? Do you expect him to just jump right back in and, and be what he was before? Yeah, that's the big question. Uh, we, we don't know. The highlight packages SDSU has been pumping out have showed him running the ball still. And for those of you that remember, Mark was a dual threat quarterback that freshman year. Uh, he passed for about 1,600 yards, but he rushed for 660. Uh, you know, with 22 total touchdowns, he was a finalist for the freshman of the year award for FCS. Uh, freshman of the year award, excuse me. Uh, really a terrific player. Again, we don't know how his health is. And we don't know if the Jacks losing their starting quarterback two out of the last three years uh, while running the ball is going to be a factor in, in the direction of the offense. But man, you just, he's so good in the open field and running the ball that you hate to take that away from him. Um, there is uh, the backup quarterback it does run the ball a little bit more. Um, he's from Jackson County um, in Minnesota, South Central Minnesota. Uh, Rudy Voss, he had kind of the viral clip a few years ago on Sports Center um, talking about the state championship game in Minnesota, uh, how much football means to, if you've ever played it, the bus trips, the time with your teammates, the practices. Uh, really an awesome clip. They started to use Rudy last year um, in, a, in kind of a wildcat quarterback role. We'll see if there's a package of plays for him uh, just to eliminate some of the hits on Mark. I'm just, we're all really curious to see how that plays out. And then you look at the the backfield, no Pierre strong this year, this time around, but Isaiah Davis, excuse me, Isaiah Davis stepping right in. He's a preseason all American already. Uh, the, the expectations are, are they there for, for the Jackrabbits too? That do they see him? not necessarily being Pierre strong, right? Cause he can only be Isaiah Davis, but stepping into those shoes and, and filling them. Yeah. So last year we got to experience uh, the full, the full Pierre strong experience because Isaiah got hurt in the, in the preseason and we didn't get him back or not preseason non-conference <laughs> and we didn't get him back until uh, playoffs essentially. And, you know, in the, in the seven games he played, he averaged 7.4 yards per touch, uh, seven touchdowns, uh, for those that watched the Villanova playoff game, he was an absolute monster in that game. Uh, 200 and some rushing yards, a couple of touchdowns. Everyone remembers his run in the national championship game against Sam Houston, where he stiff armed the defender. Uh, you know, if you, if you wouldn't have known Sam Houston won as much as NCAA pumped that video out, <laughs> you know, it, it is one of the most memorable runs I've ever seen. So that was pretty cool. A player to keep an eye on that's going to replace some of the, the slashing ability of Pierre Strong is Amar Johnson. He was a true freshman last year that played in 14 games, uh, 450 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, really kind of a fun player out of the St. Louis Metro, I believe. Um, and again, just uh, he's kind of built like Pierre, a little bit smaller in stature, but lightning fast, quick. Um, it'll be interesting to see what a, uh, what a summer in the weight room does for him or did for him, I guess. Like, so again, we're talking with Matt Tolfson of Jackrabbit Illustrated.com here on Corn Stocks and Sports Talk on AM 950, KOEL and KOEL.com, previewing that game today for the Hawkeyes taking on the Jackrabbits in Kinnick Stadium. So we've talked about Isaiah Davis, we've talked about Mark Gronowski. That's not even close to all the weapons the SDSU offense has. Who are some some players on that side of the ball that that Iowa fans maybe should be a little bit concerned about today? Yeah, so so I know Iowa has their own standout tight end that, that has a lot of buzz around him as well, but so do the Jacks. Um, Tucker Craft is a name you should know for sure. Uh, in, in many of the draft wonk uh, previews so far this year, the, the, the ratings, all that, I know they mean nothing, but Tucker in a lot of them has been top three, um, a top 50 type player. Um, kind of a fun story about Tucker. He played nine-man football in Timberlake, South Dakota, he was a, a wing back, a running back. Had never played on the line of scrimmage in his life. Um, he was doing some workouts in, in Huron, and someone taped it, sent it to one of the coaches. They said, hey, come to our camp. Came to the camp, earned a scholarship. Um, you know, right towards the end of the recruiting process, things really started heating up for him. Uh, Wyoming offered him a scholarship. Um, this summer, actually, Tucker – um, had some pretty big NLI, yeah, offers. Um, NIL. NIL, thank you. There you go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, some uh, NIL offers to go 
to FBS schools, um, six figure uh, cars, houses, that kind of stuff has been thrown around is what the, was part of the offer. Uh, he's just a heck of an athlete. He blocks really well, um, can make contested catches. He's good after the catch, you know, that running back background. He's really tough in the open field to bring down. Just a fun player, 6'5", 255. <laughs> um, I mean, just watching him play, I mean, he is like, he, he looks like Goddard out there, you know, so it's, it's pretty cool. Besides him, there's a, a two twin or a set of twins, <laughs> Jackson and Jaden Yankee uh, on the outside at wide receiver, uh, both built again, really well, big kids, 6'2", 205, 210 at the wide receiver position, uh, you know, for you and I fans. Isaiah Weston was a player that scared the heck out of me for years. And I'm glad he's finally gone. Uh, but Jackson Yankee, um, you know, has some of those same type of skills, you know, deep threat um, average last year, 16.2 yards per reception, five touchdowns, uh, almost 1200 yards. While his brother had 41 receptions for 641 yards and nine touchdowns. All he does is catch touchdowns. Um, a player Jack fans are excited about though is, um, uh, Landon Wolf, an Oklahoma State transfer, uh, in the slot. This could be a new dimension. The Jacks haven't had a you know a really skilled slot player for a little bit here, and um, he he was ex- huge things expected from him last year. First play, getting the ball thrown to him last year against Colorado State, he blows his knee out though, mm. and missed the season. So he's back. I believe it's like his seventh year of college now. Um, but just to tell you the type type of person he is and character that he has he's he's played in one game for the jacks and his teammates voted him a team captain this year um so really excited about his potential uh, another player we have to talk about is at the tight end position zach hines who is a who kind of functions as a uh, you know a sixth offensive lineman tremendous run blocking um and a, and a great red zone target he had six touchdowns of his own last year on 24 receptions He's getting, you know, late round draft grade, um, preferred free agent status by many of the draft wonks again. But with Zach, though, I mentioned this, he's, he functions as a sixth offensive lineman. And I want to transition to the offensive line because that's where the questions really lie for the Jacks this year, especially against the Hawkeyes. Um, the left side, two solid All-American performers. They're on most of the preseason All-American lists. Garrett Greenfield from Iowa and Mason McCormick who have been uh, three or four year starters um, for the Jacks, just really strong, high quality players. Center position will be Gus Miller, just a smart player. He's undersized, but wrestling background really uses his leverage well. But the right side is really where the question marks are. Um, right, right guard, you know, there's going into camp, there's five candidates kind of vying for it. Right tackle uh, sounds like it's going to be Bo Donald, but he's dealt with injuries throughout his career at SDSU. Uh, played a little bit towards the end of last year and played well. Was really a highly regarded recruit for the Jacks, um, but just hasn't been able to break through and get on the field yet. So this is his chance. So I'm going to be watching the right side of the offensive line for the Jack Rabbits against that Hawkeye uh, defense for sure. We'll be watching that too. Last question for you, Matt. Largely considered the number two team in the country behind NDSU, like you've mentioned, is it national title or bust this year for the Jackrabbits? Yes, I think so. I, I looking at this roster and the number of seniors that are on it, the number of players that have played just so many meaningful snaps uh, the last two three years. This just feels different this year. I don't know what it is, but the messaging that's coming out of camp, the, the way the players are talking, uh, I think they recognize the amount of talent that's on this year's team and the experience that they have in these big moments. Um, I think anything less than, than reaching the national title would be a disappointment. Um, and I think the expectation is to, to really be a serious contender for that national championship this year. He is Matt Tolefson. You can follow him on Twitter. It's at Jack Illustrated. Go check out his writing on jackrabbitillustrated.com as well. Matt, we appreciate you joining. Hey, thanks, Elliot, for the time. Go Jacks.
And that'll do it for this week's episode of Corn Stocks and Sports Talk. Don't forget your UNI Panthers. They play today at noon against Air Force, and I will be there covering that. You can follow along with me, Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, UNI Insider for Town Square Media. If you missed any part of today's show, you can always go back and listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, etc. Anywhere else you listen to your podcast. We've got those videos on YouTube as well. We've got two hours until game time. You can listen to that preview about an hour until that game for Iowa versus South Dakota State as well. You'll have time to listen to those. They will be uploaded just before game time, so they will be ready to go. Once again, folks, my name is Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter. I'm a UNI insider for Town Square Media, and this was another week's episode of Corn Stocks and Sports Talk on AM 950, KOEL, and KOEL.com. This podcast is sponsored by Cloud Optimizer. As a business owner or IT manager, Are your cloud investment costs going up and you don't know why? It's time for Cloud Optimizer. As you migrate your business to the cloud, what you're spending and why you're spending it can get a little hazy. But Cloud Optimizer clears up the mystery and puts the cloud to work for you. Cloud Optimizer starts by analyzing usage patterns, right-sizing resources, leveraging discounts you may not be aware of, implementing automation, and much more. And by reducing unnecessary expenses and maximizing performance, Cloud Optimizer guarantees you a savings of five times what you spend for their service. As you utilize cloud-based services more and more, you don't have to lose sight or control of your spend. You can stay agile, streamline your costs, and optimize your performance, plus save significant money with Cloud Optimizer. Make the cloud work for you with Cloud Optimizer. Get a free assessment and find out how much you can save by going to cloudoptimizer.com. Go to cloudoptimizer.com for your free assessment. That's cloudoptimizer.com.